Hey everyone, next we want to talk about the example of refugio spill. The refugio spill is a likely um, useful model for the still unfolding Huntington Beach oil spill. And we learned a lot when we worked this spill and uh, want to discuss that today. Uh, first thing to say is there's tons of folks that helped out with this, mostly students uh, in this class and our related classes. And you guys and your forebears did a fantastic job at helping us understand what was happening and interpreting what um, played out. A summary of what we're going to talk about today um, from Refugio. Short version is that the Sandy Beach was the impact epicenter of this 2015 oil spill. Um, it harmed sand dwellers. Um, unclear how much harm it had to birds and marine mammals, warm fuzzies. Um, but clearly some, but, but not as significant as uh, we, we initially feared. Um, and then had some significant socioeconomic impacts that were likely um, the bigger part of the story uh, across a wider swath of the coast. Really became clear, once again, as with many of our modern oil spills, this notion of the Gordian knot of the incident command, the, the hard to understand and interpret, etc. cetera, uh, incident command that's overseeing the oil spill. And then in general, very interesting um, here that there is a, a strong contrast at times between the ecological impacts and the perception of those impacts. And that was driven by the patchy nature of the oiling and the uh, poor communication from, from incident command, especially early on. And that uh, the other takeaway is that, that we really leveraged our, our, not only our students, not only you guys, but also our classes to really help understand what was going with this oil spill. So. Um, you guys are to be congratulated. This was fantastic. Uh, as a reminder, based on what we talked about last time, uh, so Refugio is but one example of a modern oil spill, the largest being, of course, a Lakeview Gusher in 1910 um, that spilled over 11 million barrels. We talked about key sizes of important oil spills, um, but spent a good amount of time talking about the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. It was only about 2% the size of the Deepwater Horizon spill, but yet was super important in defining much of how we think about and approach to, uh, and our approaches to uh, modern oil spills. Um, so again, we reviewed the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, the specifics, and uh, the key themes there of immense oil, uncontrolled oil, um, feeling, that we, feeling that we were technologically impotent, we couldn't respond in a manner that was as sophisticated or as rigorous um, as the assaults that we were seeing um, as they unfolded around us. Uh, key theme was really coming to terms or really coming to the public consciousness of the degree of impact from oil spills. And the famous quote from the president of the oil company that owned the platform that, that had the blowout, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. And that, of course, leads to the media and public firestorm and the portrayal of, of oil executives as uncaring and, and all of the stuff we talked about before. Okay, so now we're on to the refugio spill. This, was, this happened in late spring of 2015. We had just gotten out of classes. I had just, we had just assembled our Sandy Beach monitoring team, many of which are, uh, many of you have also participated in our Sandy Beach monitorings over the last, uh, last few years. Um, we just assembled the crew and like just literally gave them all a week off and said, okay, just finished finals. You guys go take a week off, go camp, go sleep, whatever. And we'll, we'll reconvene in about a week and, and start in our spills. Um, they didn't get a week off. This is what happened. The Plains All-American pipeline broke. This is a pipeline transporting oil from um, oil production facilities to uh, internal um, refinery uh, areas in Kern County. Uh, this was a choice. The people of Santa Barbara for many years were lobbying for this and finally got it approved that we would de-emphasize tankering and trucking and emphasize pipeline-based oil movement as a safer alternative. Not safe, but safer alternative. And so this pipeline runs along the uh, runs along PCH 101 right there along the coast, along the Gaviota coast, um, where it then turns inland and joins another pipeline and goes and takes oil to crude oil to um, Kern County. 
Uh, what happened was a failure. What happened was a, a low pressure warning showed up. This, this Plains All American is owned by a company based in Houston. So the control center is like a, a uh, NASA control center going to Mars with all these crazy control screens, et cetera, um, where they manage pipelines across the nation. They had a low pressure uh, warning light, which isn't super uncommon. We, we sometimes get these, uh, these uh, warnings on these types of uh, infrastructure. And, um, and so, but the problem was the technicians thought it was okay. Um, and so long story short, they said, ah, oh, it's fine. And they, they reactivated the pump. And so there was obviously a leak. This was caused by the thinned wall, the, the, poorly maintained pipeline in the, in, the, in the corroded, eroded wall of the pipeline was very thin. It broke um, and was leaking oil, and that's why the pressure light went down. It was not an error. It was a correct reading. The technicians reset the pipeline and said, start, um, start pumping. And as you could imagine, when you suck honey through a straw, it's hard to get that going. Once it's flowing, it's kind of okay. But um, the hardest part is to actually get that, that first pressure when you have this relatively viscous fluid moving. So as a consequence, when they when they restart the pumps, there's actually a spike in pressure higher than it is under routine flow conditions, and that extra spike further broke the pipeline and led to this uh, dumping. Um, additional confusing, just random luck of the draw was uh, our local EMS, our local fire um, department guys were doing a hazardous training uh, a, a drill a few miles from here. And so initially, when people started uh, when people started reporting there might be an oil spill or a problem, initially there was a little bit of confusion, and people thought, oh, this is just they're, they're seeing this staged uh, activity, and that's what's going on. Um, but after uh, after a short time, when when calls were coming in about smells and odors and stuff, um, they actually tasked some of those individuals at the drill, hey, can you guys go drive up a couple miles and go check to see if anything's going on? And they were actually the first. Uh, official governmental representatives to to recognize what was going on and to and to fully sound the alarm. What happened was the pipeline broke over here on the right side, on the inland side of PCH, and began pooling up oil in a depressional area, a little sort of seasonal wetland uh, swale type of type of uh, part of ranch land. And uh, and so and so the, the initially it started pooling, pooling, pooling. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the oil uh, actually, the, the, the pool got high enough that it actually f filled a culvert that's designed to deal with rainwater that went under PCH, dumped out over here on uh, Refugio State Beach. And then we started seeing the impact of oil on the uh, littoral zone. So uh, ironically, uh, so this is a pig. A pig. Uh, there's two types of pigs. One is an inspection pig, and they're, they're cleaning or maintenance pigs. This is essentially a, a robot or a slug with a camera kind of thing um, that goes down the pipe and travels the length of the pipe, checking for things, uh, using things such as electromagnetic fields, etc., to look for issues. Um, ironically, um, maintenance had been done, inspection work had been done. Um, in the immediate lead up to this spill, unfortunately, the data had not been looked at yet. So it had been checked, but we'd not noticed, uh, uh, but in engineers had not yet checked the full set of data and hadn't noticed the weakening of the wall of the pipeline. So uh, immediately, boom, oil spill happening and all the echoes of 69. This is the largest spill in the area since the 1969 spill and the largest spill in California coastal areas uh, in 25 years. So there was great fears and great memories of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. And so all the things that we talked about before um, basically played out here. Um, this notion of, you know, all these barrels of oil just sitting there. And this is this is citizen science folks as a, a citizen not citizen science, but citizen activist folks going in and just scooping up the oil in the initial hours uh, and day or so. Um, the classic picture on the lower right here of these UCSB students sort of walking into oil to grab the poor oiled bird, and this was caricatured and, and became the fodder for political cartoons, etc. And then, of course, we have up there is uh, now Vice President Kamala Harris, um, at the time Attorney General Kamala Harris for the state of California, and she, of course, had to fly down and 
be pictured on the beach doing something. It was a windy day, so the whole entire time she ended up holding her hair and basically claiming we were going to hold the parties accountable and um, and all the other uh, typical um, speechifying that, that happens uh, in these situations on the beach, again, beginning with President Nixon in the, in the um, days after the Santa Barbara spill happened, and he was accused of not doing enough, so he flew out to... Uh, to show up and walk on the beach and do nothing but just look like he was present. Okay, so now when we have a spill like this, the first thing you can do when you have a large volume of oil is you can actually just suck it up directly. And that oil can be can be used, right? That Much of that oil is probably okay to be refined, etc. The stuff remaining, so the stuff you see here mixed into the soil, sediment on the plants, that will go to a waste site. But but uh, first you suck out the stuff you can and then you, you scoop out the contaminated soil. We were actually preparing for this for years. And in terms of an oil spill, you really need to be, in other, many other of our coastal disasters, you really do need to be preparing uh, quite a bit ahead of time. So this picture of our coastal monitoring team was from 2014, right? So long before the 2015 spill happened. And these were these are folks out at our um, Santa Rosa Island Research Station where we're training these guys how to do sandy beach monitoring and, uh, and coastal mapping, et cetera. Um, I, yes, so not only that, those teams of students, we've had funding sources to prepare us. We've had other classes that have prepared us, like our Louisiana trips and our field methods classes. Um, uh, we really have been, we really were building a ship and getting ready for this um, with our technology competencies, our new laboratory facilities, et cetera, uh, before the spill hit. Okay, so the day of the spill. So I started getting some phone calls from media saying, hey, you know stuff about oil spills, right? And you've worked on oil spills before, and, and tell us what's going on with this oil spill. And I was saying, you know, literally, what? What, what oil spill, right? And so um, I said, well, we need, we need you to comment on this oil spill. So I said, I, I can. I'm driving to my son's uh, Boy Scout meeting, troop meeting. And uh, they said, okay, we'll go to you. And so this is Kelsey. So she was the first one to show up and start asking questions. And then it became um, a huge uh, media circus after that. Um, based on her comments and, and what I was started learning and started Googling on my phone, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is horrible. So I immediately called all of our students or as many of them as I could find and said, we got to get up there first thing in the morning before the sun comes up um, and start monitoring, start collecting samples, etc. We can't wait another week or two or a month or so for our routine monitoring. We got to start monitoring now. And indeed, we got there and were, um, we got there about 17 hours post-spill and then started collecting data about 19 hours, uh, 18, 19 hours post-spill. Um, and so this picture is at El Capitan State Beach. Refugio, just a couple miles up, is, is full of oil. And as we're collecting this, we're smelling oil and we're starting to see slicks offshore. The people behind us are wildlife, oiled wildlife care network folks looking for uh, potentially injured or oiled birds. And as we were monitoring, actually the beach got shut down and all the um, public was, was forced to leave. So we were allowed to stay and continue our monitoring. Um, and then again, more media found us and they kept finding us, blah, 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 for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and it was great that, that uh, most of our students were the ones that were doing a lot of the talking, which was fantastic. Um, okay, so when we have one of these oil spills like Refugio, warm fuzzies capture the headlines. So here we have this sea lion on the right. Um, uh, unclear if this individual was killed by the oil, but um, uh, possibly uh, harmed by the oil. And then we have things that are clearly weird. So on the left, this is a viral photo that made the rounds on social media. This was a, a blackened, uh, oiled um, dolphin, one of two. And so this was evidence of, of huge concern. And this really drove the media and the public to be thinking that the, the main focus here uh, was marine mammal, was bird impacts, were these vertebrate uh, communities. Um, the reality is the hidden crit critters are more likely um, uh, the things that bore the, the hardest uh, force, the hardest negative aspects of this um, spill. Okay, so here we go. So let's look at those. So this is, so what we're seeing here are dead sand crabs. This is a sand crab on the surface of the beach. You never see a sand crab like that. Um, now, these guys molt, they cast off, cast off their exoskeletons um, as they grow, but um, so it's not uncommon to see, you know, a fair number sometimes of exoskeletons in the surf line or in the swash zone, but uh, you don't see intact individuals or, you know, individuals with intact tissues and stuff like that. Um, we saw that during the um, refugio spill, and so that was concern. That, that 
you can see here intermixed amongst all these tar balls. Uh, you see these dead guys, dead critters. Um, and so that was our first sign that there was potentially elevated mortality in our sand crab community. But it wasn't just sand crabs. There's other things that live in and around the sand that are intimately associated with the sand and, and, and likely uh, exposed to high levels of tar when the tar was coming in on the um, on the waves. And so the, the one of uh, perhaps most concern here is a, is a species increasingly rare. These are California grunion. These are be uh, fish that spawn on the sandy beach. They spawn at night uh, during only some times of the year, but this is the time of the year where their spawning was beginning to ramp up. Um, so they do it during high tides, uh, during uh, nighttime hours, so there aren't, there aren't uh, seagulls and things eating them. But they go up and they literally jump out of the water, swim out of the water, go as high as they can up on the sandy beach, wet, wet sand, lay their eggs, fertilize their eggs. The adults flop back into the water and uh, go about their lives. The, the juveniles here, and here what you're looking at on the lower right, are eggs that we cord uh, as we're doing our monitoring uh, for the refugio spill. This was in Marina Park in, uh, near the city of Ventura. We also found uh, grunion eggs in places like, uh, what, like uh, um, 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 uh, Leo Carrillo and, and various other sites. Uh, so, um, so what we're worried about here is these eggs intimately, so, you know, very vulnerable. Again, the youngest life history stages, the, the sperm, the egg, the larvae, the embryo, those are the most vulnerable um, to any kind of pollution, any kind of uh, uh, assault chemically, et cetera. And so the concern was that these eggs were right in harm's way. They hang out for about a month, and then the next high tide, they, they you know, the larvae swim out uh, to sea. And so they're potentially being exposed to this oiling for uh, many weeks of their development. Uh, in terms of quantifying impacts, the official approach is the Natural Resources Damage Assessment Approach, uh, usually pronounced as NERDA, and this is the formal process overseen by the, by the agency over, uh, you know, taking charge of the overall impacts. In the case of stuff that touches the ocean, um, it's usually NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but the general approach is to look at the deviation from pre-spill conditions, pre-impact pre baseline conditions. In some cases, because we don't have robust baseline monitoring or, or the nature of the, um, uh, of the organism impacted or what have you is highly variable, in those cases, we work on estimates of likely impact from things like laboratory experiments, et cetera. In an ideal situation, the spill would have happened within the context of routine, long-term, well-resourced baseline monitoring. Now, this was the case in the context of um, our rocky intertidal communities. So our rocky intertidal communities, uh, the marine program has been monitoring those, uh, those sites quarterly across the state of California for uh, about 30 years now. And so we have some great data there. Um, and indeed, this was sponsored by uh, the, um, the MMS, which, is, which was the predecessor to our current um, uh, federal agency that manages oil spills, um, Bessie and Abom. Um, are the daughter agencies that we now have. They changed after the Deepwater Horizon. But the Minerals Management Service first funded uh, these, these initial long-term monitoring efforts of rocky intertidal habitats, and they were really key. Unfortunately, a lot of our habitat that was impacted here um, was Sandy Beach. A much, much larger proportion of the area was Sandy Beach rather than rocky uh, intertidal. But nevertheless, that was still helpful. So we have long-term, well-resourced baseline monitoring. We use it, and in general, we, we uh, the ideal approach, again, is using this sort of before-after control impact, or so-called Baki, or the, the, the more modern envision of that, revision of that, which is the before-after control impact paired sampling protocols. Uh, and even there's been some newer variations in recent years after that. But again, the idea here before and after means we can control for temporal variation. And the control and impact means we can control for geographic variation. And so by having lots of monitoring sites before the purported impact and after the purported impact, we can actually quantify the magnitude of the change. And so that's the ideal situation. Rarely do we have the ideal situation, but that's what we'd like to have. In our case, um, we started uh, the, uh, we took the, because we didn't have a, a long, long-term uh, baseline of the Sandy Beach in fauna community, we turn to trying to estimate the impact. 
And so this is, uh, these are some images from some short-term ecotoxicological experiments we ran um, using emerita and using tar uh, that was uh, put in water. And so we had different concentrations of tar, and we created that originally from mixing 68 grams in a liter of, of sea, per, per seawater um, and have, and have um, uh, you know, the most oily water. And then we, we have that and have that and then use clean water, and we put sand crabs into different um, uh, containers, this different replications, and looked at impacts. Um, students really love living the crab life, so we have um, uh, both. We looked at mortality, outright mortality, and sublethal effects of this oiling. We didn't see a huge impact in terms of mortality; nothing, made, nothing particularly significant. Um, uh, just this is so we have three species of sand crabs. Mostly we use emerita, but this is just for comparison. So this is from Silver Strand in Oxnard, which appears to be a big hot spot. Where'd they go? A big hot spot of uh, sand dwelling crustaceans. Lots and lots of big news from Silver Strand. Over. Oh, we feel the eggs. Whoa. That's what we call grabbing. So on this this uh, uh, in, individual as a female, and she has a bunch of eggs, and she's keeping them right tucked underneath uh, her abdomen there, and so uh, and so we could both use eggs for our experiments and adults from uh, at the time unimpacted beaches. Um, and so, uh, obviously, the, the death is, are things dead? The other uh, metrics we looked at um, included a variety of things, but, you know, we can't ask you if you're fatigued and you, you, um, you know, stay up all night and you, uh, you uh, uh, I ask you to do a quiz or whatever you might be, you might do poorly on the test. And that cognitive um, decline is a key indicator of stress, right? We can't, we can't give sand crabs quizzes but we can ask them to do their normal behavior and, and time them. So in this case, what we do is we um, get a dish of clean sand and clean seawater. We take individuals, uh, drop them, and time how long it takes them to bury. And so initially we started this with big, huge tubs, and then we realized it took forever to find the crabs once they buried themselves. So we just use a little thin, like an inch or so worth of, worth of clean sand. And we, could do, we do this several times on each individual to get the average speed of burying. And this is a natural behavior. So they, if they get swamped by a wave and then have to you know, recover, um, again, these guys are individuals that are living right in the swash zone, right where the, where, the water, where the tides break. And so they're constantly kicking food in their mouths and living in, living in this uh, uh, swishy, swashy, um, turbulent environment. And so sometimes they do get bumped around and knocked over. And so they need to be able to bury themselves quite quickly. And so that guy just buried himself. Um, and so, uh, uh, no, we didn't see any uh, strong effects on short-term mortality or on behavioral differences, but we did see the clearest impacts and pretty darn clear impacts were on the babies. And so on the left, you have an, a bunch of eggs that were exposed to tar. On the right, individuals that were um, in clean seawater. And the first thing you notice is most of these guys in clean seawater have two eye spots. Their eyes are developing. They're, they're growing normal. They're looking pretty healthy. Over here, we have way fewer eye spots, right? And so these are eggs from the same batch. So these have been growing the same amount of time, same temperature, water, et cetera. Um, and so eye spots, really weird. And also much more common, um, a strange shaped, um, uh, uh, strange shapes inside of their eggs. So the babies were getting whacked. Um, the other, another key thing here was how much oiling was happening, how much tar was accumulating in different places. And it was really interesting that initially we started getting tar and we, it was hard to tell where the tar came from because some of this tar was, began showing up in Manhattan Beach, 150 kilometers south, and it was unclear. Is this absolutely from the refugio spill? Is that really possible? And, and so uh, normally you'd take this and you fingerprint the oil, you look for the chemical signature, and you, you try to identify where it came from. So we initially took samples, gave them to the Coast Guard, et cetera, and then pretty quickly they said, yeah, no, don't give us any samples. We have to maintain chain of custody for legal reasons, and so we will do all the direct sampling ourselves. 
and then um, and then we pretty much didn't hear anything. And they said, oh, we'll let you know what happens. And they, they would tell us, they tell the media, tell political representatives, we'll let you know what this is from. Uh, and they did not. Uh, at least they did not um, in any kind of timely basis. Um, instead, the responsible party, which means the, the individual that caused the pollution, in this case, Plains All-American, said, we're going to treat all these tar balls as if they are from the Fujio, whether they are or not. Turns out they mostly, if not all, were. Um, but they said, we don't need to tell you if it is from us or isn't from us because, uh, you know, we're going to clean it up anyway. Um, so it would take uh, almost a year to get the data out. Okay, now we do have an oil spill on along the coast like this. We have a so-called SCAT team. And these teams are going to walk along uh, the coast and they're going to look for uh, the degree of tarring and they will create a, um, a, a scoring system for each area of the beach. Um, now, this should be done and then put up online and we should all know it, but it took forever to get this data out. I mean forever. So in this particular map, which is showing the oiling of this stretch of the Santa Barbara coastline um, in, the, in the early days of the spill, um, this is dated 526, so just about a week or so after the, the spill started, but this actually wasn't findable until about six weeks later, six or almost two months later. Um, and so everybody's like, oh, it's on the website, it's on the website. It was, it, it was not. Um, and it was, as, as someone who was desperately looking for this and talking to everyone, um, it was not readily accessible. Now, this wasn't nefarious. I don't believe people were trying to hide this data, but they were just busy doing other things. And with, when, when strong transparency and, and quantitative data communication are not a priority, they often are, don't happen at all. And so you can see here from this, this data, which is good data, which is, which is real, but you know, heavily oiled here with the red, then lightly oiled, then red, then uh, orange. Uh, we have some that are, no, there's no oiling right next to heavy oiling, right next to moderate oiling, right next to very light oiling, and then moderate oiling. And so, so it was this very much patchwork uh, oiling here and there. It was not um, what we might more typically expect. Now this is an example of oiling in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon spill. And this is more typical that what, in terms of what we see. So here the oil came, the currents are pushing the oil this away. And so this area around the Bird's Foot Delta, the Mississippi, heavy oiling, pretty much. Um, and then on the back channel over here, the, the outer coast, heavy oiling. Um, and then as we start to go the, on the Chandelier Islands, et cetera, heavily oiling on the outermost bands. Once we get inside, on average, pretty light. And as we get farther in, even lighter. So generally, this is what we see. So, so this uh, 2010 Deepwater Horizon example shows what we typically see, which is um, proximity to the source, heavy oiling. And as we go far away, it, it usually declines pretty rapidly. Um, because of the nature of this oil being floating offshore and accumulating and then dopping in here and there over the course of weeks, um, it was very heterogeneous. So again, we would have an area that was clean and then you go up the coast half a mile and it would be moderately oiled. And you go up the coast and it would be clean. And then you go up another quarter mile and it would be heavy, et cetera. And so this led the public really having very different perceptions of the oil spill. So very often we were stopped by people in clean areas and because they assume we're with the media or with, with the government or something, they start yelling at us. And they go, this is all baloney. You claim that we had this horrible oil spill and there's no oil here, right? Because their, their particular stretch was spared. Similarly, we'd be at another area on the coast and people would stop us um, that had heavy oiling and say, what's going on? The pictures say that there's oiling, but it's not that bad. Oh my God, it's super out of control. Why are you hiding the truth? And, and on and on. So it was extremely easy to get a misimpression of the level, the overall level of impact across the coast from any one particular site. And most people only know their one particular favorite beach site. And so because of that, because of the fact we were trying to run some experiments, because of the fact we were trying to interpret what was happening, we um, uh, had to just make our own measurements of tar. So when we went to beaches, we started after a short bit, uh, quantifying the tar ourselves. So we had our own in-house measure of the amount of tarring. Um, and, and so we did that. Now, the other thing, so, so those are ecological impacts we talked about to, sh to uh, crabs, et cetera. Um, we also are important, and we also find it important and are interested in the socioeconomic impacts of 
spills like the refugio spill. And so we, um, as, as many of you have helped us out and or will, will be helping us out in the coming weeks as we do our uh, annual public opinion polling for our coastal class here, um, we want to know about uh, people's perception and behavior, et cetera. And so this is a lady, I blurred out her face, but this is a lady taking one of our surveys as we're uh, surveying for um, uh, impacts from the 2015 refugio spill. We surveyed, okay, so so um, I should say that uh, perceptions are important. Perceptions really do matter. So in this case, this is, from, again, from our class data, but this is a, a sense of negative impressions over seafood. So how many people think we should avoid eating seafood from the Gulf of Mexico? The Deepwater Horizon spill is in 2010, and so we have relative, so only about 18 odd percent people think it's it's safe to eat initially early on um, in 2010. Uh, the spill happened in April. The survey was taken in the early fall, uh, and the rest of these were in early fall. And when we hit 2011, it's about the same. It goes up a little bit in, tw in 2012, not significant, but nevertheless still go the t trend was to go up. And so we see every year it roughly creeps up a little bit more and a little bit more. So it takes it can take a long time to get rid of some of that negative association, especially if it's a, it's a significant spill or the spill had significant impacts on the people in question. We also, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so, so we, we were also asking about seafood um, from other areas and have been asking about the, the confidence people have. Do they think it's safe to eat seafood from other regions around the planet? Historically, we asked about California seafood. When the 2015 spill happened, we realized, oh my gosh, we need to ask about maybe some different regions within California. So this was, if we, so this is, are we confident in in seafood? Um, do we think seafood's safe to eat from the Gulf of Mexico? Right. So it's about 18 percent or so. Compare that to about 55 percent or, or so folks that that thought it was safe to eat um, seafood from California. And that number doesn't change very much from year to year. Doesn't really fluctuate that much. And so it sort of stays up here. But then we realized in 2015, oh my gosh, we also have to ask about the specific area. Now the Santa Barbara Channel, Santa Barbara, Ventura, uh, the Channel Islands, the most diverse catch of seafood um, compared to other areas in California. So we don't, we don't catch necessarily as much biomass. We're not catching Dungeness crabs and things of that nature. But we do get um, you know, tremendous variety in terms of uh, items, in terms of fishery landing in this region. And so, so we started with the refugio spill asking about people's perceptions of the safety of seafood in the Santa Barbara Channel area and the rest of California. And so we find is the Santa Barbara Channel area initially was about 30 odd percent or so people thought it was safe um, versus about 50 percent of the statewide. So there was clearly an effect of the spill um, which had reduced confidence in seafood, and so therefore this would translate to some degree in people avoiding seafood and or avoiding purchasing seafood from the local area. Um, uh, by the end of uh, the, within a couple months, um, that had started to disappear, and within another year, it had pretty much disappeared. Okay, we can also ask how other behaviors might have changed in the wake of the oil spill. So. Um, this is from data from 33 different beaches that we surveyed um, in the immediate aftermath of the spill. And so we asked how far did people, okay, so this is our relativistic score down here, our relativistic score of tarring, uh, you know, from no tar at all to heavy tarring, number six, and how far people dro repeatedly drove to get to the beach that day. Zero miles, 20 miles, et cetera. And the short answer is there was no significant effect of how far people drove to get to the beach. So people uh, drove to a beach, didn't matter where it was. However, if we asked how much money they spent at the beach, spending declined. And so at those, at those non-oiled or minimally oiled beaches, people spent, uh, you know, they spent money, right? They, they got hotel rooms, they got restaurants, uh, well, you went to restaurants, have lunch and stuff of that nature. As soon as we started getting to this moderately heavy oiled beaches, especially the very heavy beaches, people reported spending very little money. So they came to the beach, saw the oil, and said, I'm gone. And so they took off. Um, we also see uh, uh, consequences in turn. Okay, so this is, this is some of our longer term data. And this was um, how, uh, trying to explain some of the factors here. And just for example, uh, people that believe climate change is a real threat we need to deal with now versus people that don't believe it's a real threat. People that think it's a real threat 
um, about two thirds of them um, think we should eliminate offshore oil drilling. Whereas people that don't see climate change as a real threat, only about one third of those people see that as a problem. Um, we already mentioned this, so this is, but this is the seafood data again, in a little bit more depth and detail, but again, the same pattern persists. Um, and then in terms of that oil spill stuff um, here, so this is some of our trends. So this is the long-term data that we've been collecting in this class, right, with you guys. And so this is things you're contributing to. This wasn't created for a research project. This wasn't created for a capstone. This was created so that we could understand, our class could understand um, public perceptions, but it's turned out to be a really useful tool that's had benefits for capstones and the National Park Service and other agencies, et cetera. And this particular oil spill is but one of those. Okay, so here we're asking support for offshore oil drilling. People can say they want to reduce it, or people can say they, they want to absolutely stop drilling, cease drilling. They could say, we want, I would like to reduce the, the amount that we're doing now. Keep as is, which is only, only drill and produce in existing leases, so no new uh, drilling permits, um, no, no expansion of drilling. And then uh, we can ask you, some people could say, actually, I do want to expand drilling, right? I want to in increase uh, what we're doing. And there's also, of course, the option that I don't know. Um, and we'll, the first year we had relatively low sample sizes, so this is a little bit of an anomaly. But by the time 29 rolls around, we have uh, some really good data. And, uh, and, and it's really nice sample sizes, and that's pretty much persisted through most of our surveying. So we didn't see a strong influence on the Deepwater Horizon. I didn't see a huge influence of the Deepwater Horizon spill. The error here is about 5%, plus or minus 5%. Um, and so uh, pretty much things are more or less steady. And then we hit the Refugio oil spill. With Refugio, um, we actually have uh, significant deviations. In fact, the other thing to say is we, we actually also have been seeing something of a, of, a, of a continuous decline in people that want to expand drilling. So right now, drilling, people that want to expand drilling, they're not significantly different from zero. So we, we don't even know if it really is anybody, statistically speaking, um, wants, to, uh, wants to drill or wants to expand drilling. Um, what we've, we have seen is we have seen an increase in the proportion of people that want to reduce or cease drilling and then a reduction in uh, the amount of people that want to just keep doing business as usual. And so as with other things, we see a strong initial response to the oil spill and there's, then there's a bit of recovery afterwards, but it doesn't recover the, to the full extent, um, to, to the level it was pre-spill. So these spills do have strong impact on, on people's perceptions of the natural world and what is risky and what is dangerous and what we're doing, what we are doing. And in general, uh, the 2015 spill eroded support for offshore drilling in California. Um, the other thing I'll say just by way of wrapping up is that there's all kinds of other subtle things. So these are two of my friends from graduate school. Uh, uh, one of these guys was coming through town and visiting, so we went out to lunch. This was at, a, this was at Joe's Crab Shack, which no longer exists in Ventura. Um, and so we're sitting there and they're asking me about, um, this is about two months after the spill, and they're asking me what's going on with the spill because I, I was doing all this work. And so I started telling them, and I obviously am a little bit loud, and I, I have a strong voice. And so we're sitting there talking, and uh, this guy walks over after several minutes and says in a very angry voice, sort of clenched jaw, can you please keep your mouth closed? This is my job on the line. Stop talking about this, meaning the oil spill. And that was pretty crazy. <laughs> So, you know, I said, oh, man, hey, sorry, I didn't mean, inter you know, to, to upset you or whatever, but, you know, this is what I'm working on. This is the oil spill. And he just wanted us to not talk about the oil spill. Didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want to say what the eff effects were or weren't. Just wanted to avoid everybody talking about it because he was so concerned that this would um, harm him and his family uh, economically. And so, you know, it's important to remember there's, there's all kinds of folks that are impacted by these spills, not just the folks that are directly impacted, but the companies, et cetera, um, institutions that are associated with routine activities that are disrupted um, in, as a consequence of these spills. And then again, uh, just to reemphasize, the, the, the Gordian knot of the incident command um, it was crazy. So once, once these things get going, they are, they are bureaucracies, uh, pretty crazy bureaucracies. And uh, they, they can do a good job, but, but trying to crack that incident command, um, just as we tried to do last week down in Huntington Beach, was, whew, it's hard. Um, we use a lot of our tools that we use in class to help the public and reporters and, and others understand the spill. So we're using 
um, our websites, etc. It's a great effect. Okay, so that's so in summary about refugio, what happened there with the spill. Oh, I, I also didn't say um, I should have said I didn't have a slide here. The um, the Pl Plains All American was taken to court and found criminally liable for um, several aspects of the spill, most of which related to maintenance and to a lack of timely warning of the federal agencies, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and, the, and of course, the other effects are things like Venico, the oil company um, based in Ventura, shuttered, uh, closed its doors because it went bankrupt because it could no longer deliver oil. It was already sort of marginally financially. Um, it quick claimed Platform Holly back to the state. It gave the state one of its platforms uh, and said, here, it's yours now. And the, state, the state's still working on trying to figure out what to do with it, how to decommission it. Um, and, uh, and other oil and gas production has uh, suffered. We uh, just last week had a hearing in Santa Barbara County about trucking oil because these, these wells are shut in. They can't, they can't get their oil out because the Plains All-American Pipeline, while it's been repaired, has not been recertified. So we've not run oil again through the Plains All-American Pipeline since 2015, which is crazy, right? Um, we have this infrastructure, we should be using it, or let's not have the infrastructure. But, um, but uh, in the case of Santa Barbara County, the proposal was to truck oil in tankers. That was, def it was defeated, it was a recommendation vote only. It's currently in front of the Santa Barbara Board of Supervisors. Um, and they will decide whether they allow trucking of oil. If they allow trucking of oil, this will allow um, various uh, wellheads to go back into production and start producing oil again. Okay, so the key takeaways from this refugio oil spill are that um, the Sandy Beach was the impact epicenter in this case. Um, most likely strongly harmed sand dwellers. Unclear how much harm to the overall warm, fuzzy community, the vertebrate community. Um, clearly some impacts, but not as massive as uh, people initially feared. Uh, several socioeconomic impacts, they mostly lasted relatively briefly on the order of weeks and then um, recovered in terms of people's spendings, etc. Um, again, the overall challenge of the Gordian knot of the incident command, um, where uh, for large stretches of time we had no information, we were getting no information, uh, all during a time when the media and the public was ravenous for info, information, and so they're clamoring for something. So they would they would you know beat our doors down and ask us what's going on, and we were happy to tell them what we thought was going on. But it's it's would be much more ideal if our government infrastructure was the thing that reported to them the facts and what was going on. Um, as far as uh, overall impacts, there uh, the key thing of this. 2015 spill was the notion of the ecological impacts versus the perception of those impacts, and it was highly driven by the patchy nature of the oiling, of the tarring that happened across this huge swath of coast, um, and, and, and also augmented on by that dysfunctional communication that we mentioned before. And overall, uh, we, we did a great job, uh, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back, but I think we did a great job leveraging um, you all, our students, and our class-based learning opportunities and data resources and data collection abilities to really help um, uh, both the wider public and, um, and folks looking into the, the damage assessment uh, understand what was happening with this oil spill. So that's the 2015 Refugio oil spill, you guys.